Okay, this is episode <coughs> 17 of Oversight. <laughs> and I'm the usual host, Thorin. Got Monte Cristo here, who, interestingly enough, you know, I, I actually told him to start investing his esports dollars into real estate. And I don't know if he's not getting paid much by the Overwatch League, but I've heard he's starting only invested into online real estate, like virtual real estate, you know. He's got That's a few right. properties already. I'm, he's sort I'm, of developed I'm a domain them. troll now. i just okay. taken all the domains. Yeah. Well, <laughs> can you show me the way to all the domains? Right. So, yeah, the, here's the thing, okay. The people who are the guests on this episode, Monty, this is an example of where you guys are all amateurs. You all think you're all hilarious with banter and memes. But here's the thing, right? When you're doing marketing and memes, etc., you got to actually put a bit of thought into it. You don't just say the first thing that comes in your head, right? So this, these people here, Semler, formerly of CSGO, Bloodline Champions, a little bit of Dota along the way, some StarCraft 2. We've got Hexagrams here, obviously from the beginning of Overwatch. He's one of the few guys who was allowed to survive the Hunger Games, you know, has been relegated <laughs> to the shadow realm of challenges. Like he some was the have. only one. Exactly. The Hunger Games is yes. the, you know, the one guy who comes but here's through. The right? thing. Here's the thing. Every fan in the world has attempted to make a clever casting duo name for them, right? And they've come out, oh, what should we go with? Is it Semler Grams? Is it, is it Gram X or something? But you took me sex? No, it took, no. <laughs> way better, got a way better one than you, mate. It took me five seconds to come up with this. Their casting duo name is Sem Hex because they've got the most explosive casting style. Uh, that's pretty good. It's not bad, fair, is it? Fair enough. It's fair enough. It wasn't yeah. bad. Listen, listen, boys. I do this for a living. Okay. So <laughs> you guys stick for you guys. It's shit posting. That's my career, motherfucker. That, yeah. Anyway, could be the name of a title of a show, right? So for this episode, obviously we all watched week three of the Overwatch League, which was the week where everything went to shit. Before that, there was the logic, there was patterns to things. You could sort of use scouting reports to figure out who was going to win games. And then week three <laughs> was presumably where the script writers were like, right, now we got to sort of mix it up a bit. Now we got to have like, you know, The Undertaker loses at WrestleMania finally, you know, like we're going to mix it up a bit. So let's start out in the realm of the sane, Monty, which is that London Spitfire beat San Francisco Shock. Now that sounds about right. That seems reasonable. That's about what I'd expect, you know. The week was starting off fine, you know. Likewise, you know, we went down the first few matches, all going good. So London Spitfire, right? As it started out in that match, were there any hints that there might be anything going wrong for the London Spitfire? I mean, I think there have been hints over time that... London was not going to be necessarily the best of the all Korean rosters, especially because they were losing maps to like Florida mayhem in sort of dubious ways. They were also, uh, you know, losing, they lost a map here to the San Francisco shock and they, they haven't been the most tight team of the all Korean rosters, I'd say. And they've dropped a few more maps and generally looked less competitive. Sure. So, okay, hexagrams. The problem there is, right, I understand why people by default wanted London Spitfire to be some dominant team because they took in two amazing teams and then the logic was like, well, either they could just run one of those teams or, you know, whatever mix they made, surely it'd be, like, even better. What do you think? I mean, by the way, they have still won most of their games, but what what has held them back from being the dominant team? Uh, London uses their ultimates in a very strange way in that they don't use them together ever uh, at mm-hmm. all. So it's very like uh, one of my favorite memes actually is recently. It's like, hey, London, why don't you just buy Philadelphia? Because that was the funny thing about London is they just bought a couple of really good rosters. Mm-hmm. London is uh, they, they got all the talents in the world on that team. But in my opinion, they've always been the third best of the, uh, you know, we're not supposed to say Korean teams, but they are the third best Korean team for sure. And it's just a matter of I don't know why you take those two rosters and you, you splice them together, then you don't let those rosters mix, and then they're trying to mix them right now. There, there might be coaching issues going on there, but London just, uh, every time they have an ultimate up, they just smash Q, and that's the reason that they, they lose a map to a team like San Francisco. Okay, that's an well, interesting Also, point, actually, Also, then. they've yeah. shown really, uh, I agree with Hex, but also they've shown weakness on some specific maps, and they lost to Boston mm-hmm. without playing it, but like they suck on Oasis. Like They lose every, yeah. they lost to Dallas on Oasis, they they lost to San Francisco on Oasis. I, I don't know what's going on, but some maps they just they seem. Suck on that map? <laughs> well, they're not like when you look at some of their Oasis games, like they're playing 
they're they're playing like dive comp on university so you know we're not seeing a lot of the tanks that we typically see uh they're playing they're not playing a lot of farah uh they just keep playing dive no matter what even on or they play mccree and tracer on on gardens so they're not even playing like farah which is one of the best heroes for that particular map and it's difficult i think to win games without it so I, I just don't know. Like they play, they play dive. They play like Genji Tracer constantly, and don't ever shift their strategy to actually, I think, suit Oasis a bit better. Okay, but well, maybe maybe this ties into what I was going to pick up on there, which is when Hexagram said there, maybe there's some coaching issues. That's one thing that people won't have stopped and thought about, which is that one thing that's very famous in Korean teams is that the coach can actually often be very involved with designing the philosophy of the team or like the structure of a hierarchy of shot calling. All these different factors can be medi pre like predicated on what the, t the coach wants. Well, if you take two squads and you take them elsewhere, and are any of the coaches in the Spitfire actually from the original Kongdu or yes. uh, GC oh, Busan teams? Yeah, it's yes. Bishop, right? It's Bishop's well, from no, no. PDP. Well, no, they, but they also have the uh, strategic coach from GC Busan is on mm -hmm. that roster still. So, like, the head coach went okay. to um, went to Seoul Dynasty, but the strategic coach remained on that team. Uh, so that was the guy who was designing most of the strategies. Bishop serving as more of the overall head coach slash GM. I don't know how involved he is in their strategies. And then they have a, they have Jay Feel as well. I think from uh, from uh, Kongdu. Okay. Who's a former professional Heroes of the Storm player, uh, who is coaching <laughs> Kongdu Overwatch. Okay. So Samla. Quietly dying in the corner right now. How did the Boston <laughs> Uprising beat London Spitfire? Going over the results again, it's interesting. They won three to two. They went three to two, and they played. They beat them on Ilios, which was where London actually won on control earlier on the week one versus um, Florida. So I'm like, no, not against Florida. It was against um, whatever, against another team. They'd actually looked good on Ilios, and then they actually lose it to uh, Boston. So, you know, it's like a lot of discussion about Oasis right now, but uh, the other one that we've actually seen, I mean, this is the, this is going to be the tricky thing for these teams is the fact that they don't get any say in which maps there are. So, you know, perhaps we see a whole lot less Oasis and we see a whole lot more Ilios from London if they're feeling more comfortable on that map. Instead, instead they're just forced to kind of roll through these uh, maps and hope for the best. Boss is a mean, hard team to prepare for, I would say, though, because like Stryker because also it went batshit in that series. I mean, you got to be fair. Like Striker just true. went ape, and Striker's been very good for Boston this entire time. He's been the standout player for him, it. Feels like for quite some time now, at least in the first three weeks, all these matches. We, we but he really went into overdrive versus London. Like he had he had a bone to pick with those guys. We've been saying how like static Boston is of like dive comp and this and that, but like when you have a guy like Dreamcast who plays everything, then you don't know what they're gonna run on control. And like that's the control is how they wrestled away from that. They won like uh they won Ilios on control, then they got to game five and then then on uh Li Zhang. Sure, and yeah. You, you, yeah, you have no idea if Dreamcaster is gonna be running Roadhog or if he's gonna be running Farah. That's not like a hero pool that you can prepare for okay. really well. I, I really I really disagree with you guys. So <laughs> no play, no play. I really disagree with you guys. So the thing about it is that we saw we saw Boston uh, beat London, and yes, it was surprising, and yes, they did win both of those control maps, which is I know puzzling. You're but we, we we also have to say okay, but London was they were bouncing around players, so it was like who reg rascal with bird ring for what th uh, three of the five maps before they put profit in. And the first one on Junkertown, they put profit in. They actually win. So why the why are you doing that? Why are you why is Hureg even in this game? Is my first question. Uh, yes, I think maybe you might want to run a little bit of Farah, which is why you might bring him in. No, that's exactly uh, why. Yeah, but he was also kept in on. Well, he was brought in on Ilios, and he play he was playing Farah. So I guess they were just using him specifically for the Farah. But I'm not sure that's the best way to beat them. But if we look, if we think about how Boston has been beaten. They got fucking styled on by Seoul. And you know what Seoul did is they Boston's only top tier composition, like that can compete with other top teams, is Tracer Genji Dive. And what Seoul did was they played anti dive with Orisa Junkrat and uh McCree and Roadhog, and they just backed off whenever they dove in, punished Kellex for ulting early, and Boston got swept. Well, so let's get down. Yeah, let's get down to brass taxes. 
<laughs> every no, no. every every team's top tier composition includes a acer like a tracer ace. Like you have to have a good tracer. Every team okay, when they suck, they move great, back to like yes, exactly, exactly. And you run that. And then the, when they don't run that, they have to go back to it. No, but I think I think like sure Boston did great, and we have to we have to applaud them for having good dive capabilities. But at the same time, they there was a metric, there was a way that was shown by Sol on how to beat these guys. But we, you know what? We don't see other teams doing that. And I think a big problem for London is they don't have a good junk rap player. So what are they going to do in this meta? They they don't even have the capability to anti strat or counter strat Boston. Can Hoorag not play junk rap? We we haven't seen a lot of junk Come rat. On, yeah. They have twelve players and not one can play junk rat. Not not to a world class well, level. Just better, playing, than, look, better than the team they're playing. What we, say, what we can say is they're not playing junk rat. Yes. Yeah. Well, hence why perhaps is a coaching issue, right? Uh, possibly, sure. Okay. Because here's Assembly. the thing: how much of this? Don't worry about that, Simon. You don't see anything there. And also, by the way, I'm, none of you guys know this, but you'll see the picture I've used. It's hilarious, right? Anyway, so. <laughs> Well, let me ask this then. How much of the win was actually Boston being really good? How much was improvements from Boston? What's changed for Boston? I mean, Don't I think... Turn your camera on off, please, because it moves <laughs> fucking things over. It's just off now, mate. Well, right, I... It's on now. Fucking hell. I... <laughs> I have to edit this shit, you know. It's my life. Right, keep going, Monty. <laughs> um, I think Boston is has been very good at running the dive composition, and I do think that they are slowly expanding in their second win of the week against Dallas, uh, even though it was a pretty close match. We did see some better, I think, far up play from them overall. They can't they they have tried to be adaptable. It's just that their other compositions aren't quite at the level of their dive composition yet. They are okay at running some other comps, and I think that if we're talking about coaching, we really should be applauding the coaching staff of Boston because they figured out how to hone one strategy to a very good level. And I think we should assume that with Dream Casper's versatility on DPS, that they will be able in the future to be good on other strategies as well. Does that mean, though, anyone can answer this, does that mean at the moment that in winning this big game, it will in some way put people on notice and now people will be able to neutralize them to some degree or it'll be more predictable what's coming? I, I would have I would have thought that's what the soul game would have done for people, but then we didn't see that actually Spitfire happen. Spitfire one, yeah. Or, or yeah, no, the soul game would like show people how to beat them. Oh and right, okay. They wouldn't be doing as well as they are I now. See what you mean, but yes. it is surprising to me that after seeing that game last week, and also remember, Boston also lost to the San Francisco Shock, so they've been pretty inconsistent overall. Had a great week this yes. week, but last week they got totally screwed by by a soul and then they lost a, a game that they probably should have won the reason boston's only good at dive is because the moment the dream casper goes on to farah then the mercy's with him the entire time and they refuse to run anything except a zenyatta on the ground so you have two tanks on the ground and a zenyatta orb between the two tanks not going to work out gamsu dies immediately every time he jumps in so when they go to the farah Everyone else dies constantly, so they still try to run this dive, but there's no healing on the ground because the fair is always with the Mercy up top, and no one's getting healed on the ground. And then eventually they switch onto the Genji, and like, oh yeah, now we have the point. The problem is like they just don't have the healing on the ground. I, uh, you know, I I'm just gonna keep pushing this until it happens. Like just more red, just more around the ground, and keep people alive. But. When you take the mercy out of the mix for the tanks, you watch uh, the, the the times they try to push in, especially on Dorado. Gamsu dives in, there's no one healing him. He's got an orb on him, but it doesn't matter as like 400 HP Winston. You're going to die. The moment they go to Farah, it takes the mercy out of the mix, and that's why they struggle there so bad, because the tanks have no healing on the ground. Okay. So... What about then? So later on, obviously, Boston got another upset. They beat the Dallas Fuel. Right, here's the thing. If they get one upset, I'm totally on board with the idea that, like, usually the team that got the upset, if it's, like, one upset out of, out of nowhere, it usually means the better team had made some mistakes, did something wrong, didn't know. But this is two big scalps in a week. So are we conclusively seeing Boston going somewhere? Like, well, is Boston just going to keep going up? I mean, if you can beat I, Dallas and beat London, why can't you be top five, top four? I think we have to ask the question is how big of a scalp is Dallas at this point in time? Uh, I think the most impressive thing to me was that they won a match that I would not have predicted. 
because simply because the starting roster that Dallas was running, the roster they ran throughout that series, basically can only play one strategy effectively, and that's the style that Soul played against them. Roadhog <coughs> or Diva, Orisa, Junkrat, uh, and McCree or Widow, right? Because you have it's a pick composition that punishes dives if you're focusing on the DPS that are diving you. And even then, a that worse good team. Though, right? Absolutely, but uh, I think Dallas hasn't been playing as well as Boston, and a worse team still nearly beat them without changing their strategy basically once throughout that entire series. They just played that thing over and over and over and over again, and they nearly won. I think that's that's not a. I, I suppose it's a testament that the Boston players were able to use the dive against that effectively and still win the map or the match. But playing when Boston hasn't been playing well, and they're arguably not even. Um, Dallas isn't even using their best Roadhog player in Taimu, and you go to five maps against a one in five team, or one in four, I guess at the time. Is that is that a great result for Boston? I'm not sure it is. Okay. Mickey's Mickey's Roadhog was super surprisingly good, though. It like, was good. It was, yeah, it was good. Mickey played a very good Roadhog. So Assembler, here's the thing: for the first two episodes that we did for the Overwatch League. It was all about trying to use, like, I felt like some, like, political spin doctor. I was trying to be like, listen, guys, don't overreact to the Dallas results, you know. They've played a couple of Korean teams. They played Valiant. Shit, they lost to Outlaws. Well, maybe Outlaws is just getting good, you know. But you know what? There's only so long before the schedule's no longer the problem. It's your inability to win in the professional video game Overwatch that's a big issue. <laughs> because if you're not beating Boston, if you're going to be a top four team, that's supposed to be where you start to pick up the wins. I mean, at this point in time, what's happening now? Have they just got a circle on their fucking calendar? Shanghai Dragons, <laughs> San Francisco <laughs> shot. Please, we need wins. Please, like, you know, what What do you think's wrong with Dallas Fuel, Samler? It feels like they haven't quite found their person, or they're lacking some firepower to me personally. And so, I'm loving it that we've already seen the development. Hastro is a hustler; he's never going to waste a single moment, and he's already getting on AKM and announced it on Twitter that they are in like oh, final okay. negotiations with AKM yes. for Dallas Fuel. So Hastro sees it; he's just like, we need somebody who can work with effect, who can yeah, kind yeah. of step up to effect's level, and if we can have those two heavy hitting DPS to play off of each other, maybe that'll be the difference maker, right? Maybe that'll turn the tide. So I mean, okay. at least at least I, I agree with Hastro in the sense that it does feel like you have Effect, who's just trying to like get this backpack on it, you know, and <laughs> just carry it, and um, he needs a little bit of help. And Taimo himself hasn't been super confident lately, which is uh, no. He keeps tweeting on like being on stream, being like, "I suck right now. I'm not yeah, happy with my like, own play." Dude, what is this mentality, bro? This is it. <laughs> you're you're in your this this should be when you are at your best. I mean, obviously you can't dictate that like uh, how you feel. I mean, those guys have been. What they they were on the road. I mean, I think it's really just wear and tear on the main roster for uh, for him, and it's caught up to him in the end. But or it's caught up to time at least in the end because it feels like he's nowhere to be found when really envy need him most. Right? Envy, okay. sorry, Dallas Fuel. They need him yes. most right now. They need him to be working. Well, oh, no, Samuel, oh, let me let me assure you, this is this is not the envious. Don't, don't worry about that. This is Dallas Fuel. Man. <laughs> in fact, here's the thing. I have my yeah. I have my own theory, Samuel. You're gonna like this one, okay? So here's the thing, right? So they've got this squad that's got all these veteran names. They all, you know, a bunch of them very, very actually considered quite smart players, players who have history in the game, you know. And somehow it's just all fucking up and the chemistry's a bit off, you know, and they can't quite figure it out. They've got Siegel on the roster. Wait, wait a minute. I, I just want someone to go off and rip off the coach's mask. Who, who's that under there? Anyway, we'll leave that one. That's an <laughs> Easter egg for anyone who was following the earlier days of Overwatch there. It's, they've become NRG, was the joke. They've become NRG. The, the effect... Aww. The effect it's, has finally begun. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you've got effect on there. You've got chips. And those are the two things that are that are really keeping these guys in the fight. If they didn't have chips right now, they wouldn't have a good mercy player. They wouldn't have like chips is the is the backbone of their back line, and he's the one who's keeping them from completely crumbling. As far as I'm concerned, well, the also, reason they won their last couple of sets is because chips is the most patient mercy I've ever seen in my life. Like there's so many times he could be popping Valkyrie and he doesn't, and he waits for it, and like he gives them the advantage. Yeah, Chips is just God tier support right now. It's so sad to see him on Mercy, to be fair. Because well, I mean, I yeah. want to see him on Zenyatta. I want to see him on Anna. I want to see him on Moira. Like, he's played them all. He could do it, but he has to play Mercy because I guess he's the only one capable of it on that team. It's also worth noting that Harry Hook was supposedly very sick this week. So oh, it seemed yes. like, yeah, they were going to run oh, yeah. him. So that was, I think, another problem is that one of their players was sick. Taimu seems to not be feeling confident enough to play. And. 
then they were sort of stuck or locked into this one roster. Do they need other players? Look, I'm not even sure AKM is the guy you need. Frankly. You had, no, but you had talent, though. Because, like, even, like, you look at that Valiant roster when they added the other rogue guys. You're like, why did yeah, they add I them? Mean, they, they have this AKM, and they have that. But, like, you just add pure talent. Just add pure yeah, talent AKM to figure it out. AKM makes way more sense on Valiant. He has established synergy. That doesn't help Dallas Field, though, team. <laughs> I know. But I'm saying, if, you had to pick, if you had to pick a roster for AKM to go to, he sure. makes more sense. Because if you need the Genji, you can always sub in Agilities or Silk Thread. Otherwise, AKM is great at Farah, great at Soldier, great at McCree. Free, but what are you what are you getting here? So let's think about the Dallas Fuel roster and what AKM could do. Oh, they already have a great soldier player. They get they have three supports, so they can move Harry Hook to DPS if they need a soldier. Right? I'm I'm pretty sure AKM picked the team he went to. I think he had several different offers from several I different know, teams. I'm just saying it's weird that Dallas he picked the team that he wanted to go to. But Instead why does Dallas having a full French team? Like, even if we have to go one player at a time, we'll get there eventually, Marty. I'm on the same page <laughs> as you, right? You know, soon, Uncle, AK, you know. There we go. We're we're on the right path. L. A. The whoa, French whoa. take over L. A. The way it should have been. Okay. <laughs> See, I'm a hexagrams on this one. Like, I actually have the same philosophy in most pro sports. I actually think that the best way, like, I think if you ever draft a player, you just draft the best player you can get in the draft. Like, you don't know where you're going to be in two seasons. You know, you don't. Know if you, for all you know, you know, all you, right. you draft a small forward and your star your star forward gets breaks his leg or something. You know, so in that scenario, if AKM comes in and it's better than one of your players, cool. Now you sell the other player who's got a big name. Otherwise, if he's not as good. He's trade bait. You trade him off to someone else. Sure. I think it makes okay. sense to me. Also, you never right. know where the meta is going to be in six months. That, that's true. You don't. But I'm just saying as far as, like, let's talk. What does Dallas Fuel need from a from a DPS player? They need a Genji. They need a Genji and, and Farah player. I guess Seagull's not going to be filling that role. <laughs> Yeah, and everyone keeps telling me that they have minute. those two, but they just don't run them. Everyone keeps telling me Effect can yeah. play Genji and exactly. that Fa uh, Seagull can play Farah. I've yet to see it in the Overwatch this, League. This is my question. Why, I mean, you don't know. Let's, let's go the other way. Off Tracer, I think. Let's go the exactly. other way. Why, why is everyone telling me all these extra things that they can play? What can Seagull play? John Bastion. There's one. Bastion, Seagull, there's two. Seagull's there's two. a great passion. He's got a deep yeah. hero pool, but here's the issue. Like, so why I always like I, I come across as trash talking Seagull. I see him play a lot of these things at ladder. I've not seen him play these things in tournaments or in when it really matters in the Overwatch League. So when I say like Seagull doesn't have that great of a Farah, I haven't seen him play Farah in of the Overwatch League. So I don't know what it is against other people who play Farah in the Overwatch League. So yes. it's it's yet to be determined is the problem. Like, oh, Seagull's really good at this. Yes, yes I. I at rank 3,900 to 4,200, he's a great Farah. I have no idea what that means in the Overwatch League. Yeah, but we do know that AKM is an insane Farah, so that at least could help, right? Yes. And it, he is good at some of these longer range hit scan characters. Could he be good at Genji? Because that's the thing. He, he tweeted that's a few days ago that he was right. going to start practicing Genji hardcore. And if he can be as good at Genji as he is at his other heroes, he's going to be amazing for the Dallas Fuel. You but need Genji it, to win assault maps. But, period. but or... Or, or, if, if, uh, let's say, Effect is allegedly good at Genji, is, is, uh, is AKM good enough at Tracer? These are two questions. He could pick one and be good at one of these two heroes, and it'll be all right. But I just, I have yet to see that, so I am skeptical about whether or not he is going to be the, like, the actual panacea for the illness of the Dallas Fuel, right? AKM's been playing on a team with Soon for very long, so he never really had hours on Tracer. I agree. You're I never going to be playing Tracer. Yeah. Okay. Like, what sense for him to grind Genji, I guess? Yeah. Sure. Okay, but but it, then you still replace know, right? Taimu. You still, re I mean, you still replace if you got, what? yeah, if you got the Pharah, the Soldier, and the McCree, you replace two of the DPS on Fuel right there, and then yeah, it's just a matter of him getting time with Genji, and then you're you're set. Okay. And then you got a six-man roster you hardly need to touch. That's true. And then you trade time move to somebody else. <laughs> Mayhem? Probably hey. the Florida Mayhem, because they're on suicide watch as well. So <laughs> why not? Right? You know, Misery loves company. That could be the new name of the team. So, okay. Well, actually, ironically, Misery does love company in fucking Overwatch. But they need to fucking remove the champion. So, right. <laughs> Elsewhere, aside from disappointing Western teams... Valiant keeps winning, but you might have thought it would be more dominant fashion this week, right? Because they played Gladiators and they played Florida Mayhem, and it wasn't it wasn't as easy as you might have expected. So what do you think of Valiant at the moment? 
Uh, I mean, they've got some chutzpah considering they reverse sweeped <coughs> Gladiators. So that was an impressive. I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, they were really shaky in the first two. It didn't look too hot. And then all of a sudden, they were able to pull it together off of the control <coughs> on Ilios, which was a nail biter. But then after that, it's just like, bam, 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 bam. Um, hmm, I, yeah, it doesn't speak to a team that's rock solid or is as solid as you think. But that does, that does show you that there is a foundation to work off of if you're able to keep it together when you're under the most pressure like that versus your hometown rival. Now you talk so much about like when the meta changes. If Mercy ever comes out of the meta, she's gone. Then the Valiant are going to be stronger because no one in the Valiant likes playing Mercy at all. Like, what do you Uncle see? Uncle, you yo, it bleeds through the screen that he hates playing Mercy. Like, just watching him play it is so hard. Like, I guess Kareem was giving him like a couple weeks of like, hey, hey you could play Zen, but like, and he had to move him onto Mercy. It was not fun to watch. And if they ever get to like a Zen Ana meta, then Valiant can crush because I still think that those are the two best support combos in the league and I will even pull that up against like Jay Hong and Toby together like I think Unko and Kareev as a as a duo are an amazing support duo it's just right now neither of them like playing Mercy well and I, I would argue even though Unko actually played much better against the Mayhem but again that was against the Mayhem in that particular match that started off this week with the Gladiators even at the end, when Valiant was coming back, he was dying first in a lot of those fights and getting yeah, picked yeah, up yeah. in a really yeah, unfortunate yeah. way. So I, I do still... It could have just been an off day for Unko, but he his individual performance and his <coughs> positioning on Mercy was like super off. Against He's that, it's, uh, so. it's that French melancholia that was kind of bleeding through the screen. <laughs> I must play Mercy. I do not care. Oh, I am dead. But I am dead inside already. <laughs> 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 That's pretty you know? accurate, I feel. <laughs> there you go. Having seen having talked to Unko in the past, he, he does he does seem to have that that melancholy, as you say. <laughs> he's he's not even a fan of his own team's colors. He won't even buy the skin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Noah really appreciated him streaming and saying that their team skins were ugly, which by the way, I don't think they are. I actually think they look fine. So I, think they're great. I, I like it. I like Why do we have those? Because they go with the golden guns. You got some gold with the green, gold with the black. I mean, it's perfect. Because here's golden what's gun. exciting, guys, is that this week, right. Valiant plays Philadelphia and Boston. Now, that in itself doesn't sound that exciting. You know, they're expected to win both games. But here's the thing. Since, Are they? Uh, that's who they play this week. Yes. Here's the detail. Since London plays Seoul, if Valiant wins both their games, they will be above a Korean team at the end of the week. Yeah, but are they expected to win both those games? You I think, like, you know, yeah, you still got like the, <laughs> you still got like the top three teams, right? Oh, by the way, expects. by the way, I'll just say this at the beginning: hexagrams. Don't tell me, well, are they? And then walk it all the way back and explain at the end that you're predicting them to win both games. So go ahead now. You've set up the challenge, sir. Go ahead. The floor is uh, yours. I already, I already took the challenge of being on with Ord. So all Come right. On. So, but no, but I, I think it's it's very much like there's the top three teams, and everyone's very surprised when they get upset or whatever. Yes. But I think that the rest of it like the the, the uh, rank four through maybe even eight of these quote-unquote western teams and some are more western than others it's really up in the air i mean philly came out so strong boston i think it could be valiant very easily i guess uh the gladiators are just an emotional team that can beat anybody and then just go home on one day and not even show up the next day so yes the valiant i guess would be Favored, but like it's like a 51 49 kind of favor in those situations. I think Philly and Boston both have a, such a good shot against Valiant, and that it's it's really strange to call them like favorites because I think it's still a mess. It's a okay. bit of a mess between four to eight. I also, I also, I also think Val I Valiant is, <laughs> um, it, it doesn't have the best uh, matchup either against Philadelphia, because if we think about the way that Philadelphia has been playing, they've been playing a very aggressive backline dive with a focus on killing supports overall. Um, and so when we think about Unko's positioning on Mercy and the fact that he is dying at first in a lot of these fights, and Carpe and Shadowburn have been very good at killing supports that are out of position, I'd be a little bit worried if I were the Valiant. I think there there is a way that they can definitely lose against Philadelphia just because of the stylistic matchup. So well, how you, does okay? No, sorry, I'm looking through the yeah. How does Boston beat Valiant? Hello. 
Uh, nice. You just uh, no, you just play you play right against them. You play the exact counter dive. The moment they okay. jump in, you jump into their back line. And you try to get more value. Like it's it's fine to play dive against dive, and it's just a matter of like who's getting more out of it. So the moment you see their Winston jump in, you send your own Winston, your own diva, and you try to get like two to their one, and hopefully you get a peel in your own back line that one of your support stays alive, where you kill both your supports, and like that's a one fight immediately. So like the. When when it was the meta where it was like six months of just dive v dive, it was mostly like who's getting more value out of their dive because you didn't sit back and catch the dive. You said, "Oh, they're coming in. We're going in, and we're going to get more out of it." So like that's how you win that. Okay, so okay, Samla. One of the reasons why Hexagrams is like a born again Philadelphia Fusion fan now is because they beat the mighty New York Excelsior. So what do you think of New York Excelsior at the moment, son? Oh, what do I think about New York? I was yeah. going to talk about Philly and the chance that Philly could end top four okay, here. Okay, let's talk you about know, Philly. Then. Let's go. Yeah. Considering, like, I'm looking at week four and five matchups for yeah. Philly. They've already gotten the hard matchups out of the way, so they've got to take on Valley, yep. which they could definitely win, which is going to be really interesting. Then they get a feel good match against the Dallas Fuel. So, you know, I'm considering the shape of both teams right now, I yeah. kind of put Philly ahead of Fuel. So they are, they could potentially go two and zero in week four, and then week five they get to end with a very satisfying match versus Florida Mayhem. So it's like, they get a lot of nice matches. There is going to be one fire match yeah. for them in week five is Philadelphia-Boston. That one's going to be a lot of fun to watch. But I mean, it's like, I would say 3-1. Three, three, they could get another three wins out of this, out of the remaining matches. And that okay. could put them right up there. That could put them right up there at the top of the pack. A team that everybody was just like, Look, who are these guys? And we expect them to be bottom feeders. Yeah, especially... Especially because if Seoul loses to London and Houston this week, which is not outside of the realm of possibility, yeah, then yeah. Seoul might not even be in the stage playoffs. They would drop them to three losses. So And Seoul plays Valiant after that as well, so they've got a pretty not that easy run from this on out. Yeah, they definitely have a harder run for sure. And considering I mean Houston has been on a hot streak and they've been doing it by sort of beating bottom teams, but they have not dropped a map in the last 16 maps. So that's pretty impressive. Um, so there are I, I think I think as a result either Philadelphia or Houston still has a shot to make top 3. So why is it then that Philadelphia is matching up with so many different teams so well then? Raw skill mostly. Yeah, Dream. I mean, uh, not Dreamcast, but Shadowburn. I mean, that guy feels like he's always getting something out of it. Like he holds his dragon blade. He's like chips with Valk. He just holds his dragon blade forever, and he's like, "Oh, now I get four kills, and we win the fight." And you're just like, but how did he just consistently do that every single time? Instead of throwing it away, he's always getting value out of his dragon blade, which is absolutely bonkers. I mean, the thing is, Semla, in, in in Overwatch and in life, you know, just because you can explode and just go off completely sometimes it's better to hold it in wait for the right moment wait till everyone's set make sure you're on the same wavelength with everyone you know then it can be a, a religious experience and uh yeah in the game as well yes yeah, yeah, <laughs> transcend yeah. so okay i hmm. so let's talk about new york yeah let's talk about yes. new york because save you'll be in, uh, i mean this week was really interesting just because we didn't see pine we did, Why we does Sabiobi just release. tweet about the fact he has a wife all the time? Like, I get it. Okay. Like, I thought he was joking. <laughs> well, you've, you've heard he the wife. phrase, happy wife, happy life. I mean, she clearly watches his Twitter, and then he's making okay. himself like a <laughs> very... Okay. He's comfortable, comfor comfortable at home. Fair enough. Okay. So what about New York, then? How could they lose to Fusion, but then beat Seoul? All right. Well, I mean, Hex, I think you've got the point for this one, mate. I mean, like one about Seoul, I don't think we know exactly what their power level is. They had a really weak schedule to come out <laughs> the gate. They yeah, came out on. like, well, well, they came out like four and zero, oh, but it was yes. against like teams that are like, eh, they didn't really face anyone before sure. that. But like, also, I think you look at Seoul and you think of like uh, the the. the teams comprised of Korean players, which is my nomenclature for Korean teams nowadays. They have the weakest tracer play amongst them. <laughs> Sabiobi is the okay. best tracer in the entire league, and like it's been a tracer meta since the game was released. Look, she's the cover art. She's the logo for the Overwatch League. <laughs> tracer <laughs> is an important hero to have. <laughs> Sabiobi crushes the other tracer that he goes on about his day. So you're always going to struggle. 
Why have we become some sort of SJW language police <laughs> nightmare where you can't call it a Korean team? It's called a team of Koreans. Uh, you know, is this? We have, we, have okay. meetings, we have meetings and such, and you know, they're well, not well, a Korean uh, team. Well, Seoul is a Korean team. So what they're you're telling Seoul, me, hexagrams, is that that London Spitfire is a British team, yeah? Clearly, yes. You, they are oh, a bunch of they're, 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 bunch of, they're right. a bunch of they're a bunch of they're a bunch of good blokes. <laughs> they go to they go to spins <laughs> or spoons, yeah, spoons yeah. Well, all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Good blokes. Um, no. I want to uh, see one of them drink a yard of ale. Until we can do that, they're not British. Get the fuck out. Like, I, I think that that's Duncan, the you part. don't. You don't even like beer. You haven't even drank a yeah. yard of ale. I haven't. No. The biggest question about <laughs> some of these are jokes, Monty. You know, they're not. They're not all literal statements, mate. Keep on. Come on, hexagrams, right? Yeah. So how? I, like we, we were, we were working our way around. To, like, <laughs> you were actually downplaying New York Excelsior beating Dallas, da- beating Seoul Dynasty. Right? No, I think I think New York's the best team in the league. I think I, I call okay. that actually that New York was going to be Seoul very easily. I think New York's DPS are so strong. Then you have like a third DPS and Jonak. Like they're their tank okay. plays. They're good across the board. The, yes. the most frightening thing about it, and I hope I came across in the cast, is like New York played poorly against Seoul and still beat them. Like those are mistakes that you can fix. They they got off the card a couple of times. They played sloppy. They they threw ultimates away where they didn't have to. They played bad and still beat Seoul. You haven't even seen New York's final form. Yeah, so I think it's their final form. Well, their final form is them continuing to grow with their teamwork to compensate, well, to sort of catch up to their individual playmaking abilities. I'm not even sure they need that, honestly. And uh, especially because, like we were talking about, Sabe Yolby, he is, when we talk about Sabe Yolby specifically, we have to talk about what he does differently than other tracers, which is that he targets enemy DPS. He is the best, hands down, tracer versus tracer player in the world yeah these are the fights that he's winning he's killing the dps so he's not going after the supports first most of the time he eliminates the dps threat specifically the other tracer most of the time and then he proceeds to wipe the rest of the team so that's what's so dangerous about him honestly is he just tracks the enemy tracer and destroys them and then you're down a player and they you know you're down to dps you don't have the damage necessary to finish the fight and he could just clean up the supports for free after that so it's incredibly impressive what he's been doing well, just, just to just to add on to people who maybe have not seen a ton of competitive work, watch the World Cup where in Sinatra, everyone loves Sinatra, and I think he's a great tracer. He got shut down so hard, and that's the reason that the USA was not even very competitive against that team. Yeah, Except for like one or two maps, but yeah. Do we follow, <laughs> do we follow that reasoning even further then that this is a key... This could be a key as to why Jonak is able to do the damage that he is because he doesn't have to worry about that enemy tracer when he's got Sibyulbi who's just constantly pounding yeah. that guy into the sure. ground. All of a Absolutely. sudden it lets Jonak do 50%. Like Jonak was doing an insane, like he might as well have been a DPS. He's still healing, keeping up with yes. the healing, but he might as well be a DPS with how many orbs he's actually hitting in a game. Well, the other, the other reason that he's doing so much damage, okay, there's, like, there's three reasons. I think that's definitely a reason right there that you just spoke of because he's not harassed by an enemy tracer or enemy dive. The other reason is obviously his mechanics are great and his knowledge of when to use his right click around corners to catch people is great. But the third reason is he is damage boosted by Ark's Mercy more than any other Zenyatta. <laughs> like he is constantly damage boosted in some of these fights. So he's just dealing more damage because of the Mercy Beam. Um, and okay. anytime they're setting up for fights. So uh, with other teams, for example, let's say we think about Dallas Fuel, the beam is on effect on McCree in their last match, right? So he's the one, as as they're defending and people are walking into the fight, he's the one who's damage boosted. So it depends on which player the team is prioritizing. And New York prioritizes uh, prioritizes damage boosting Jonak. They prioritize damage overall, because even on those like, control maps where other teams are running a Lucio, right? So like we were, we were casting a game and like the, the other yeah, team's yeah, running yeah, a Lucio, yeah. right? And they, they do, they're doing about the same amount of healing, and then there's 4,000 more damage because they're running a Zenyatta. I'm like, 4,000 damage? That's like so many Winstons that you just... Like, that's the number <laughs> right there. Like They prioritize being super aggressive where their hold is is super aggressive and where they want to play is super aggressive. And that's why they're a fun team to watch. Like The best defense is a good offense. Offense, and that's New York. 
It's like six and six and a half Winston's. Because <laughs> <laughs> here's the scary thing about New York as well is their four remaining games are Shanghai Dragons, Dallas Fuel, Florida Mayhem, and then they end with London Spitfire. So they're, oh! they're basically going to win the next three games and top the league and be at the top of the league going into the playoffs. Oh, they're in the playoffs, like guaranteed, right? Oh, there. it's eight Winston. Sorry, <laughs> I did my math wrong. That's good. That's good. Hold on. <laughs> No, they're they're def- they're definitely in the playoffs. First like stage already, one. Yeah. What is it? They're yeah, they're five and one, and they've gotten most of the hard matches out of the way. That's bonkers. As much as I root for Shanghai, they'll probably beat Shanghai. Is it worth mention? Is it worth getting into Shanghai a little bit just on that that match that they had? Yeah, we've got about two minutes. I so mean, what, what do you like about them, Samla? <laughs> we got about two minutes. <laughs> I get Here's out, the thing. Get I'll give face. you an open mic face. to say I'm everything good. you no. like about the Shanghai no. Dragons, starting now. <laughs> I'm not I'll put a little egg one. timer and turn it over. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> okay. Get out of my face. Come on, what do you like? About <laughs> you, so you gave him two minutes and he said nothing. There I know, it's mental, isn't it? <laughs> He's like, oh, fucking pressure. Shit. <laughs> I cry. Look at me. I'm just I'm like uh, curling up in on myself. Uh, no, no. I mean... It's it's I, the one th- the one positive thing is kind of like the the obvious thing is just okay cool they are making progress with time they've got yeah. so much ground to cover they're winning in maps. terms of part of me they're winning maps finally yeah they're winning maps finally they're getting close to winning maps finally they, it looks like they're starting to tighten up and actually co- like the the comms seem to be getting better a little bit at least as far as you know securing kills so I mean it's cool it's positive and I think that's why everybody's getting behind well everybody's getting behind them because obviously you know you you kind of feel bad they're getting stomped so hard at the beginning of the league. But now, if they actually start to be able to pick up some maps, maybe, you know, maybe it isn't unreasonable to think that they can actually win one, um, win a series before okay. the end. Although, I mean, they are playing New York here's, to start. Here's the theory craft for you, okay? So right. the problem they have, Semler, is the last four games. Yeah, I'm looking is, at those now. Is actually, <laughs> is literally they've got um, New York Excelsior, London Spitfire, Dallas Fuel, and. Um, Valiant. Who's the last one? Valiant. So Valiant. basically, yeah, it's, it's hard mode now. You know, it's hard. Uh, you mode know what's now. you know what's weird is maybe they have the best chance of beating London just stylistically because mm-hmm. when we saw Phil- the Philadelphia game, sure they they had Hot Button Day fly in, and maybe that wasn't you know they were playing uh, experimenting with some of their Korean players who may not have the best communication with the team right now. But uh, when we go back to damage boosting and mercies. You know who had like a permanent damage boost beam on him that entire game was undead. And basically the problem, the the way to beat Shanghai is to wait until their tanks engage and then just stand there and kill their tanks. You don't dive them because if you try and dive them, their supports are next to undead. Undead will just outplay you. He'll He's very good mechanically and he's got the damage boost and the heals on him and he just kills anybody who comes in that back line. That's why Philadelphia was struggling was because even though they could have just killed Roshan like every time he engaged and then waited, they kept trying to dive onto two supports and undead on a Widowmaker. I'm like, why are you doing that? That's dumb. Sh- Shanghai has top five DPS two in the league, like bar none. It's the rest of it that's really kind of falling apart. And like your tanks are never going to be good when you have the support play that you have right now. And those guys are just not playing the roles that they're used to. There's a lot of people playing Mercy that don't want to play Mercy and they're not very good at it. Uh, I think there's some rumors that Shanghai is, is signing some new players. Yu Fan Jun should be coming over. He is a, a support flex specialist. I think they they lacked kind of the, the damage output of the Zenyatta that a lot of other teams had. And he can come over and he can really play that Zenyatta for them. Maybe that'll help out a little bit, but you can't like honestly make an argument that Undead and Dia are not two of the best DPS players in the entire league, but that's what the, the beauty of Overwatch is. Like, yes, they are this good at aiming, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because everything else around them is not working out. I think Season 2, Shanghai is going to be a team to be reckoned with. Right now, they're still really rebuilding that team, and they need some of these people to turn 18. That's it. Like there's Some of the best yep. people in, in China and some of the best players in China are 17, and they won't be 18 until next year. So we'll see. Right. They have a ton of raw talent on that team, and now they're trying to make some changes. And I think that uh, even in the last three weeks, we've seen Shanghai get better and better and better, and they will continue to get better they're they're not a joke at all they can definitely play with everybody in the league 
Well, I, I yeah, I, th- I think that for now, as they continue to improve, it's just a matter of their matchups. And, he, and they have, a, like you said, they have a hard schedule going forward. So I don't think we should expect them to be anything besides 0-10 at the start of the first stage. But when the second stage starts and they can field some of these new players, because remember, player signings can happen now. We assume they will be signing new players, especially some players probably from the former Miraculous Youngster roster. Uh, then... If they come into stage two, they could be a lot stronger. But as far as this stage goes, with the strength of schedule, with the fact they have to play New York, which is honestly just like stylistically terrible for them. Like that is <laughs> that is the worst team for them to play because they're more defensive and they're they're just gonna their front line's gonna instantly be vaporized, which is how you should play against Shanghai given what we've seen yes. from them. Oh, those weren't leaks, by the way. That's just what I read on Reddit. No one actually tells me anything. I just read Reddit. So, so hexagrams. When you, like when the you rest said, of us. <laughs> when you said that a lot of people, I mean, not just in this team, you referenced other teams as well. Basically, I think it's a valley as well. Basically, don't like or don't want to play Mercy, or some of them just can't. What is the nuance there? Because obviously everyone makes out like it's just the most easy character to play and you know anyone you just know exactly it's so boring you know what's the nuanced element of playing it that's that's actually different or requires <laughs> yeah, some sort of form? yeah you have to be like a very calm person it's mostly about like when you use your stuff right so we saw Kellex play a very good mercy the other day and that was like a very brave mercy he's getting in there and he's getting out with like three hp and he knows where the other supports are i think chips's mercy is really good for the style dallas wants to play where um they they lose two people early in a fight, but he doesn't just pop Valk like, hey, we're going to be up six to six. It's fine. He waits and then then they get two kills then they get three kills. Then he has it for the next fight. So it's it's mostly just controlling when you're going to use your abilities. Some of it is movement ability, but Guardian Angel is like not that hard to use. Um, and, and generally, you're just holding down left click and right click for the most part. So it's it's mostly the ultimate management of like, do I have this for the next fight? They just pop Valk. Are we going to win this fight beyond that? And then you have, that's a guaranteed next win fight, or it should be in most situations. If you have Valkyrie and the other team just popped it, you're going to win the next point. Then you can keep playing on that. So a lot of, a lot of uh, mercy is patience, which in an FPS game about shooting people in the face is hard to find. So that that's really the, the key to playing mercy is knowing when to use your stuff. And it's mostly alt management. And when you have the time to sit in back and like just build your own alt is also knowing the other team's ultimates and just managing the entire economy of the game so what are the what are the problems that are preventing soul dynasty from just being the best team in the overwatch league tracer the lack of a tracer player at least it sounds like mm. they, they have, they a, have tracer a good player. tracer but as they, they, they have they, an amazing one they, while well, their tracer players are not as good as london's or new york so that's the problem okay or valiants or as there's also that yeah there's also that. Or maybe maybe even Boston's. Stryker did have an amazing Stryker week. is. Yeah, he went bonk. Rush. Yeah. Okay. So if you're the sole dynasty, does that mean you have to sign someone who's an amazing tracer player? Or do you well, just sit tried. and wait for the meta to change? They tried that. They tried to get. They tried with Munchkin and Bunny. In fact, they tried to get two tracer players to see which tracer player was better. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think that's you know, when we saw their their loss versus New York. You'll notice that we had Munchkin starting in that particular match, and then by the end of it, it was yeah. Bunny playing. So it seemed like they knew they were getting dumpstered by Sabielby, but they couldn't do anything about it. And they tried. You know, even in map five, they try and bring M- Bunny in to. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. To to stop the bleeding, basically. The only pure like anti tracer composition, if you're not gonna win that tracer battle, you try to do something that's not tracer, is like McCree, Junkrat, and Roadhog. Like you have to have all three of them. That's how good tracer is there. And like the anti dive combo does work on it because like flashbang kills tracer immediately. If you have it on cooldown, it's fine. Tracer's dead. Hook is decent, but tracer is a, a decent tracer should be able to get out of it. Junkrat is a deterrent, but then she just has to go around the other side. So you, it she really changes the entire composition. If you have a Tracer that's just wrecking everybody, and Tracer wins fights with that Pulse Bomb, we've seen it on Anubis time and again, like, oh, we're going to go left side. Well, no, you're not. You're all dead now. 
So they really do have to, and it's not just the tracer that can get to the back line is a different style, but like a tracer that can check another tracer, which is why New York is so good. Is like, say Biobi understands if the tracer's trying to get to the back line, he's going to hang out and he's going to babysit. He's going to make sure that that tracer knows that they can't do what they want to do. And then he knows his timing so well. So I think really this game has, has been about tracer for a very long time. Okay. Right, here's a question for you, right? When you said there, hexagrams earlier, like, oh, you know, maybe top eight, like four to eight, it's like really close. And I noticed you name checked the Gladiators there, right? Gladiators has not won many games in this league, Hex. So, so what, how are they not picking up wins if there's some low key, like, pretty good team? I mean, they played some good teams is the issue like so you look at strength of schedule which is why i kind of downplayed soul like yeah they beat teams they probably should have beat it's like gladiators have played a lot of very strong teams i think gladiators might and next week is going to be the really telling point because they looked awful yesterday there's no other way to yeah. say it. they looked they didn't show up they they absolutely got dumpster really hard and it looked like they were tired and so that's the thing going forward that i want to see from gladiators is with the seven man roster are they getting fatigued because i I've, I've been saying it even to the people in the, in the, the talent lounge and casting lounge here is like week three week four that's going to be the big test when teams start to get really tired this is a long haul this is a marathon they looked well, tired yesterday that's one thing i would actually ask you about hexagrams because that's one thing i know from other games especially the games that like league of legends where you were in the same team house for week after week after week after week people do get mega burned out because people just mm -hmm. put in way too much practice especially when they're like super hyped early on like actually a problem I noticed in, in League of Legends was teams who like got to the team house three weeks before the first game even was played and you've just yeah, been going that's, all that's... day and all night. It's like you've, right. you've burned half your energy for the season. You know? Well, I, I guess what's nice, at least with the Overwatch League, is because we do it in stages. They will There are like 10 days between stages, so there okay. is a little bit of time to reset. I don't know if the teams will actually take a break. I assume they'll take more than like one day off, which is what most of the teams get every uh, every week during the stage. They'll probably have you know a few more days off, but at least it's not quite so, I guess, stressful. Uh, yeah. compared to compared to League of Legends, where you're just on a constant grind forever if you're a top team, and then you have to fly to MSI and everything like that. So, well, keep in mind, keep in mind that you're not only having to prac and and develop as a team, you're having to keep up with your media obligations if you're if you're a team right now, because every team is trying to grow a brand, and so you're constantly getting you know videos, interviews, all sorts of uh, additional stuff. That if you are a player who is new to this sort of thing, that that in its own right can be stressful having to figure out how to carry yourself in front of a camera and interact with the camera and interact with fans a community all of a sudden that you know that are all focused on it um so you're you're having to perform in game you're having to figure out how to work together as a unit in game but then you're also having to deal with this individual pressure that some of these players might not have had to deal with before i mean well and sure they, for yeah sure he's a vet but like the and they all just they all just moved here too. Like the, there is uh, a bit of fatigue that comes. Like I just in a new city now, man. New place, a new like new the country. entire environment. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> exactly. It's like you know, all come crashing down. And I think like this is the time we're gonna see it start happening. And I, I, it worried mostly about the teams with six and seven players where they just don't have time off. So you got a team like London where hey, I'm gonna watch this game instead of play this game. I'm gonna watch this scrim instead of play this scrim. Sure. It's a lot less mentally taxing than having to be into everything all the time. Well, okay. Gladiators have got a pretty solid two weeks coming up, at least in terms of scheduling, just because they get the middle match on um, on week four. So Wednesday, week four, they get the middle match. Then they get a day off before they get the last match versus Boston. So it's not like they have it like if um, A versus Florida, that should be they should be able to win that. So they get this rest up to Florida. Good. They should win against Florida, and then they get a full you know like thirty two hours or whatever before they have to start work. Like before they have to be on point again for Boston. So if fatigue is an issue. At least they'll have you know like an easy schedule right in terms of where it's not like they're playing back to back like they got to play friday night and then saturday morning or some horrible shit like that that boston is their must win too because beyond that they have san francisco that they have i believe uh, another have win all yeah oh, no never mind not so no, no. they have dallas fuel <clears throat> and then they have houston to end up the season which might be like a play-in kind of game too so. so they've actually had the hardest games basically in the, the in yeah. theory it's, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of an easier schedule here. Now. Okay, Monty, are you buying the idea that Gladiators are actually like low key good aside from the results? Mm, I mean, not really. Uh, I think 
like I I predicted them to be Philadelphia a couple weeks or last I guess last week now. Um, and I thought that that's just because they they started the the season with pretty strong synergy. But I I'm not sure we've seen like the the big individual performances outside of their supports. Like Shaz and Big Goose have been doing great, but everybody Shaz else, like yeah. yeah, Shaz in particular, but. Those guys are the stars of this team right now, and I think we need to see the other players stepping up if they want to actually start to win games because they, while the teamwork has generally been good outside of the Houston match, I have no fucking clue what was going on there. They looked really bad, much worse than normal. Um, I think their teamwork has been strong, but they need, they haven't, we haven't seen like the big plays, right? And I'm a bit confused as to why they're running their roster the way they're running it because I thought the purpose of Asher on this roster was so Surefor did not have to play Tracer but now it's like Surefor Hydration and Surefor's playing Tracer in a lot of maps so I'm not I'm not exactly sure if they're unhappy with Asher's individual performance or why they're making the the decisions they are Surefor is like the the a time of moment as, I don't think it's that. I think Asher is like, if you're going to definitely run Tracer the entire map, then you run Asher on it. But Shore 4 is like, like kind of eraser. So they run him on Li Zhang because he can play everything. And he plays like Widow and he plays Farah and he plays everything else. Sure. And then when they run him like Triple EPS. So like, I think a lot of it is like, hey, we don't know what we're going to go against. So throw Shore 4 in there because if he needs to play Junkrat, he will. And if he needs to play Zarya, he will. I mean, Shore 4's okay. pool is so wide. Yes, that's, that's, why that's true. But I just don't think that we're getting we're seeing the best of sure for when he has to play tracer or he has to have so many heroes I mean, what, and ready well what's sure for his main yeah right i, I understand what you're saying <laughs> but yeah. I, i'm i'm saying that i don't think that he will ever be at a top level if he continues to have to play all of these different heroes he was one of the best tracers uh in closed beta but that's closed beta so you know he he can play everything, and I think that's like that's what they're using him for is like that. Eh, we don't we don't really know, so put sure for in there. We don't know if we're gonna run tracer. Listen, hexagrams. What happens in closed beta stays in closed beta. <laughs> There's a lot of people are good in closed beta. A lot of them aren't here right now, or a lot of them are bottom of the league. So okay. Speaking of teams who you know everything hasn't been going that great for. You know that famous uh, stereotype, right? That comedians. The thing about them is on stage, they're making everyone else laugh. They seem like they're really jolly people, you know. But famously, you know, it comes from a dark place where off stage, you know, their lives are falling apart. They're, you know, they're, they're drugs, women. They're trying to fill a hole that they can never quite fill. The Florida Mayhem try their best <laughs> to put on this brave face. Like, ha ha, look, we're all just, it's all jokes, isn't it? It's all fun and games. <laughs> it's all jokes. But in the end, they're just like the fucking comedian from Watchmen. They're like, the whole thing's just a bloody joke, isn't it? The darkness in man. It's like, <laughs> these guys just can't buy a win at this point in time. Like, come on. Does it ever turn around? Is there ever light at the end of the tunnel? They're playing, gladi they're playing, um, let's see. They're playing gladiators in San Francisco shot. If they can't get a win this week, just end it. Come on. <laughs> You're not even I, in the Nordic region they get anymore. More. It can't be Look, seasonal I hope they get disorder the, or whatever. The, the, the up, yeah, it can't be seasonal disorder. Uh, maybe <laughs> they're just unused called? to all the sun. The, like, what is it? Seasonal affective disorder, I think is what it's Some called. That, yeah. But Well, they've got it, Overwatch all season all one. All <laughs> <laughs> ineffective disorder. <laughs> Overwatch season one, ineffective disorder. That's, that's probably true. But the bright side is to their six-man roster and their woes is that they can actually get an entirely new team if they want to i mean probably going to be hard to go convince people to join that team but it's a, well i mean maybe if you're they can just get all of runaway <laughs> just take runaway just take runaway break the just take runaway <laughs> are, you, are you calling them like the cleveland browns that people won't leave college because they'll get drafted no. by the cleveland no. browns they'll like, be like no listen one's gonna, no one's going to declare eligible Hexagrams. for the overwatch league on the yes. off chance that florida will pick them no, up what will happen hexagrams <laughs> is people will just say like now nah, I'm cool. I'll stay in challenges another season. <laughs> like, what do you mean? It's like, well, I want my trade value to go up. Like, you know, I don't want to. Well, I don't want to join that see, shit. But see, this is uh, this would be like if the Cleveland Browns could replace its entire roster with a good team, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> just get all of Runaway. Imp hashtag import Runaway. No, it does. It never feels good to pick on the Cleveland Browns. Like it's over. It's just like, ah, oh, come on. Like it's sad to even pick on them. And it's kind of like sad to even pick on Florida because I like all those guys. They're all very good players. They've been around for a while. If for whatever reason they can't figure out how to 
I don't know, just win a game. I, I think a lot of that is, uh, I mean, you look at the DPS players again, the DPS players are pretty good, solid, big pools. They can both play whatever. You've yeah. got a hit scan ace in Logix, and he's not just a tracer. I think Logix has proven himself that he can play uh, McCreed. He can play Widow enough to at least challenge the other Widow, which is decent. Sure. And then Tavik yeah. can play everything. Tanks are okay. Swoosh is still growing into the role. You could always move Swoosh back over to a triple DPS kind of thing because he's, he's played everything. I think the support play has uh, needed improvement. I think the nicest way to say it, the support play needs improvement. Yeah, you're right. Zebosai used to be really good at close beta. <laughs> is, that so, new, I, is that the new think, uh, euphemism, is it? I think Zebosai moving to a coaching role would not be bad for this roster. Um, I, I'm not sure how much they rely on him for his in-game shot calling, but I wouldn't argue that that's been a particularly bright spot for the Florida Mayhem either. Uh, I think this is a team that will definitely be adding players, so I'm sort of just waiting and seeing what they do. I do not anticipate that they will be taking wins. Their only, the only map they've looked good on is Dorado. That's the only one. They got absolutely shit on when they played against the Valiant on Eichenball. I I thought you meant wins the player. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't know. I don't think he's. Gonna they, they, they will not be. They, you're right. They will not be taking wins. I'm pretty sure they won't be taking wins. <laughs> um, I'm just waiting for one of these billionaire owner guys to make some fuck up like that. Like we've got to get wins, guys. That's what we've got to get wins on the board. Then they just bring it in and like, where he is? What, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> wins. There you go. That's what you wanted, isn't it? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Why'd you grab this Quake player? Why is he playing Lucio? What's happening? <laughs> uh, I, I so I think that like you look at that Eichenwald game where in on their their defense round they got four kills to forty. Valiant had forty kills on Eichenwald on their attack, and on the defense uh, that same round on defense Mayhem had four. It was uh, that... like one of the most pathetic rounds of Overwatch I've ever seen. <laughs> Is that right. bad? <laughs> the last four games for Mayhem are Gladiators, San Francisco Shock, New York Excelsior, and Philadelphia Fusion. Which one, in terms of how they match up, who are they most likely to be able to get a win off? Gladiators, I guess. I would have gone with Just Shock. Just based on what Gladiator said yesterday, though, yeah, Shock as well. They're they're both like tilt worthy teams. The teams that like sometimes they just won't appear to play. I guess you might as well put bots in the game based on some of the matches they've thrown. Reasonable. Out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold back or anything, Hexagram. <laughs> no, 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 I see. Like that's why I'm, I'm throwing shit amongst all the twelve. Oh, right, no, no, yes. no individual, okay. right? But well like, done. Yeah, yes, good. Like, like Glad Gladiators can't say they played well yesterday, yes. and San Francisco sure. also tilted off the face of the planet. And I think they're an emotional team, and that can uh, very much beat a lot of players and i think they're looking forward to the future i think san francisco is a long-term team um based on the players they're going to add in the future and i think that's going to be good but also i think if you can get to baby bay and he decides to stop playing halfway through the set you can beat san francisco it's, it's not that hard so i think those are the best reasonable wins i think i think san francisco is a team that, that i would rate san francisco as the least clutch team in the overwatch league <laughs> meaning that when push comes to shove they just fall apart, right. and it, it's like chaos starts erupting. It's a one, you know, in the final push, it's like San Francisco. You just have to defend this point one more time. You've been doing it the whole time, and then for some reason, like they have like a meltdown, and everything goes to shit. So exactly. I don't know. Exactly I think accurate. <laughs> I think that uh, I think that maybe there's there's a shot against the shock, but after I would say because I don't know, Florida played so badly against the mayhem, but they won the last map. Maybe Gladiators will still not have fixed whatever internal issue they had that caused them to get completely rolled by Houston by the next match. So I'd have to go with Gladiators probably the most likely, but I, I don't think it's... Uh, even if you just look at that score, you're like, oh, they got four out. Okay, that happens. But if you watch it, it's like, yeah, who, it was who are they? It, it, yeah, it was a terrible no, they got eight set. And a, eight and zero, mate. Yeah, I, I went home halfway through it. Like I was uh, tired of watching it. It made, me, it made me like it made me tired. I went home and took a nap. True story. Yeah. After, after that would have been funny if you'd have been casting it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here, Sevler. You know what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we don't we don't need two guys for this. Let's be legitimate. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I after that first map, they didn't even take a point. 
Like they yeah. looked semi competitive on New Bonnie, and then they just got shit on for the rest of the match. So, yeah, and the camera kept going to them, and it, they just looked sad and tired. Oh, it was bad. It's really bad. That's one <laughs> thing I have to say to Overwatch League players, right? Go and look at the great Quake players. Because here's the thing in Quake. Because I think it's such a... Men you have to be so mentally tough to play Quake. Even if you're not going to win the game, you have to sort of stay in a match. Because if you get down in Quake, basically, people just put it on you completely. They can run the score up massively and you're out the game completely. Because it's famous in Quake, right? That even when something happens, whether it's good or bad to you in the game, you never see it on their face. They always have that, like, poker face the whole time. But people in all team sport games, I've noticed... The level of emotion on them. Like you can see people who are just tilting off the face of the earth. You can just see it by their body language. It's actually ridiculous. Like, I don't think these guys realize. It's actually the same principle as where if you, you know that famous like cliched thing of like, if you like force yourself to smile, it actually mm. does literally scientifically release something like, like sort of oxytocin in your brain or something that actually makes you feel a little bit happier. And it's like, it, it has sort of like a placebo effect that will make you, make you become happy. People need to do that. People need to, to cheer up. Florida Mayhem look like they got a face like a slap dart off the time I see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Posture, posture is everything. I mean, I mean, the first guy you think about when you mention Quake like that is Rafa. Like He's Rafa's, a great example, Rafa yeah. just, you, you mean it, Overwatch Team there. Liquid Legend Rafa? Yes. Oh my god, that's right. Another that's Overwatch right, League reject. The yes. best ah. Lucio player ever, <laughs> Rafa. No, why? Why did all these great, great Quake players become Lucios? That's exactly what you, you want to know the sad reason. Because, because, because they have brains. Exactly. That's the reason. That's, that's not a joke. Because they have brains. Because that's they're the ones who are able to call a strategic game. Because yes. Rafa is always thinking 10 <laughs> steps ahead. What happened is unreal. literally all these players came into Overwatch and obviously initially, yes, they tried playing Tracer and they tried playing Soldier and they tried playing Widow. And what they realized, yeah, no know. joke, Monty, is that like, well, you can get a million players who would just have a really amazing left clicks in the fucking game and like nice little wrist without destroyed nerve fibers or whatever. <laughs> guess what? To actually have people with brains and poise who can call and stay alive, like that's actually a aware. talent. I know no one on Reddit is aware of this, but <laughs> that's actually a talent, believe it or not, you know? Yeah, it, it's just a very different type of uh, strategy that goes into Overwatch where you'd expect, for example, you'd expect somebody, and obviously we've had this, uh, MOBA players come over who are more used to managing ult economies and cooldowns and stuff like that, but I mean, it was good to see. I wish those those guys had been more successful. I guess Wins was very successful. I mean, the Liquid team had a bunch of good quick, like uh, Dehang was on that team. Yeah, watching yeah. Dehang play Zenyatta was so yeah. sick. Like they they could have gone to it, but then you know that other quick game came out. They went yeah, over to that, and that really. It'd be really it'd be, got... be really cool to see some of those guys come back and like coaching roles. Because you're right, I think it's like the brain for the game is definitely there. They should just straight up come back and playing roles, as far as I'm concerned. Like Rafa, why like, don't you they just play come back Rafa's with an all quake team instead yeah, of Florida just... Mayhem? That would be <laughs> days. You know, have a gimmick team. That Florida Quick Ham. Here we go. Yeah. It'd be, be so all sick. Of them. Cooler, it's just Cypher. Oh, yeah. it, did. it just dumping millions. Oh, no, yeah, they, yeah. They, they know. It's like they're like, well, free money over here. Right. Well, then there's the oh. player ID as well. Yeah, right. Exactly. ID could play. He was a Quake player, by the way. Yeah. He actually should no, play yeah, Quake yeah. the flag. Yeah. yeah. So why not? Right. Okay, so we haven't talked that much about the shock though. So what is the what is the issue with the shock? Because this is one of the few teams actually that most that a lot of people were like, yeah, I don't really feel it that much. That haven't really done much this split. Like there hasn't really been any high moments or moments where they had a little run. They've just been fairly consistently mediocre. So what's the problem? Oof. It's their support. I mean, again, like you look at a lot of these teams that are really struggling. It's there. It's like everyone's got good DPS in this league, like because the DPS is so very like the, it's it's a razor's edge, which is why it's really important that New York has a slight edge on Tracer over the other teams that they're playing up against. But uh, after you, it, when your DPS are equal, then you look back at like the tanks. So the tanks dying, are they getting out alive? And then the tank play, and then it's like, are the supports keeping the tanks alive? And San Francisco is struggling on both of those fronts on tanks and supports and there's some players that have been around for a very long time um i mean you, you look at dak and you look at nomi and they've always been questioned for like the last year in overwatch whether it's contenders whether it's a monthly melee or anything like that they've been questionable players at times and i think san francisco is still banking on making moves later where super will come in and then nobody may not play as much and then you, you move dak to a different role but their dps are fine they're they're playing totally fine as dps but it, in, in overwatch that does not matter their tanks and supports are struggling in areas 
It's well, I, I also got under the bus because like they just don't seem to have a good mercy. Yeah, All right. Dak Dak seems to die quite a bit in these engagements, unfortunately. Well, Dak again, he Dak doesn't play mercy. He's a very aggressive Lucio. Like he's he's very good at Lucio because he's so aggro on it, and he gets his team to play around him in his aggro abilities. But then you put him on a hero that's completely different, that's about being not aggro and about being as calm as possible and keeping everyone alive. Then the play style simply clashes with what the meta is right now. Dak, if I was going to sign a Lucio, he'd be uh, like at the top of the list, but Lucio just hasn't played anymore. Wow. Yet. Yes. We'll yes. See. We'll, yes. See. Yeah. we'll see when that patch comes. Hopefully it'll come this week. Uh, and we can... Well, I mean, they won't come to the professional scene this week. Obviously, it'll be a couple weeks until we get that. I would assume we're not going to get patched until the end of the stage. So uh, it may be better for them, at least in the that department, going forward if it goes back to more of a Lucio meta for many teams, not just San Francisco Shock. But I think I'm curious what they're going to do with Super because you mentioned Nomi maybe not being the best main tank in the league. And the thing is, is that Super, we were told Super was swapped, was had, so Super used to be a main tank. Then we were told he was going to be a flex tank on San Francisco. But Nevix has been quite good, honestly. So is Super going to go back to being a main tank? Is Super going to be a support player now? We don't know what exactly role he's going to fill by the time he comes on to the starting roster. They might be an interesting team that has two main, two flexes, because I think they could both play main and they could both play flex. I don't think you ever take Nevix out of that roster. I think Nevix is so valuable in what he brings as far as like versatility and just brains. Um, probably one of the most underrated players in all of Overwatch League. And he's been around for a very long time, but he stays around because he's so smart. Uh, Nevix can play uh, Diva. I mean, he can play absolutely. You could put him on... Uh, DPS and you wouldn't lose a beat. So Nevix always stays there. I think uh, when Super comes in, he probably is your main tank because you want your main tank to call. And I think they they really value Super in, in as far as his calling ability. Okay. So one team we haven't talked about yet is the Houston Outlaws. And the problem yeah. with their team is they still have yet to play Seoul <laughs> and London Spitfire. So yes, at the moment, it's going pretty well. They're quite high up in the rankings. They've won. How's they done it? They've won their last four matches, four zero. So they've won what sixteen maps in their last four matches, absolutely sweeping everybody. Um, but and they struggled in week one. They were swapping a lot of their players in and out. So it, it's it's hard to say how good they are because what they played in their streak. They played Shanghai and Dallas, which are Florida, I think, right? And Florida. So, like, basically the three worst teams in the league when it comes to record. Uh, and then they play Gladiators, who looked very off. Um, and that's it's still hard to win four zeros, though. You know, so absolutely. It's not that easy yeah, that's, to do that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that that does speak to a certain amount of skill from them and certainly consistency since they've moved over to running Linkser and Jake basically every match and keeping the core roster more stable and only swapping out Banny and Boink depending on whether it's control or not. Uh, but they have it. They've had a soft schedule. Um, but we'll see. I think this next week, obviously the shock, uh, they, we expect them to win that match. But when they play against Seoul, that's going to be the real test. And this is a big week for both Houston and Seoul because if Seoul loses both their matches and Houston wins both of theirs or Philadelphia wins both of theirs, there's a very real possibility that Seoul is not going to be in the top three. Which is absolutely mind-blowing. Yes. So Okay, then let's make this the last topic. In the All next right. week... There is a monster matchup. We have got the London Spitfire playing the Seoul, Din the Seoul Dynasty. So, predictions. Preview this game for me. I, I think this is probably going to be an easy win for Seoul in the same way that Boston was an easy win for Seoul. In that London plays a very aggressive style uh, that can be punished by proper disengagement. And so I think Seoul will probably lean more on Wikid and the Junkrat in this matchup. Um, and I think they should win it three, probably three to one. Um, I guess London has a better shot because Oasis, the map that they have been legit terrible on, is not in this map pool. Uh, so maybe they can do a little bit better on control. But otherwise, I think, I think Seoul, Seoul should take it. 
hexagrams who are you taking uh i want to take london just because like monty and doe are such soul fanboys at any time i can <laughs> upset them and hope that they lose i actually my favorite team right now is new york that's fine i like uh, new york better. i i think it, they're the most fun to watch in my you've, yeah you've seen the bright side uh so i think the map will favor soul in this circumstance because if it was junker town in there and maybe even lunar colony then i would probably take london but it is uh numpani and anubis instead which are a little more standard maps so i think that soul probably that's, takes it they probably lose point. ilios though yeah that's so a good that's, point. If, if lunar if lunar colony would in it would be i think probably better for london but yeah i, I mean the, the best thing for london is oasis isn't the <laughs> yeah it's 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 ilios so <laughs> okay who are you taking samla mm -hmm. oh man it is tough when you look at the maps No, I'm going to go with Soul as well. For the reasons that have already been outlined, I mean, I guess I have to come up with my own particularly <laughs> fascinating point as to why Soul will outperform London, but there is no save you'll be. I feel like the Tracer... Let's, I'll just take that point. I feel like yeah, the Tracer the battle is going to be watch. much more even between these two teams. You don't have a save you'll be to completely crush and you know the opposition and control the back line the way that save you'll be is capable of in this case. So I feel like it's going to be a much more even fight in terms of tracer play between London and Seoul. But then that doesn't really decide a winner, does it? Then the rest of it, what, is it going to be fundamentals? The fact that we've seen London be a bit more weak in the past in terms of the mental side of things where Seoul are just seem to be still rock solid. So if the tracer game is even, then Seoul should have the mentality to be able to close it out. So I'll go with Seoul as well. 